All right, gentlemen. I want to know your favorite movie stunt. Favorite movie stunt. Okay. So I had a number of things I was considering here because uh, on the one hand, I love classic cinema and and there's the temptation to pick uh, that great uh stunt in stagecoach where the you know guy is sliding between the horses and under the carriage uh on the other hand on just a personal note uh as i've attested many times to to people in my life i do love the 2013 gore Babinski lone ranger and i love that train sequence in lone ranger i was tempted to pick that but when i really thought about it um you know i'm not the biggest action movie guy and my favorite movie stunt is one that uh my fine co-host here tom introduced me to uh which is from the jackie chan film police story uh and in police story there is this absolutely incredible uh finale stunt where uh chan is sliding down a pole in a in a i believe it's a mall right tom is it a mall in the yeah it's a mall it's a mall and he's sliding down a pole he so he jumps from a railing and catches the pole in midair. But the pole is covered in decorative lights. So as he slides down, the lights are just bursting. Um, and, and this was done... Uh, the way they, they pulled this off um, was that uh, Jackie Chan uh, jumped from a railing onto a pole <laughs> covered in decorative lights. They slipped down as they exploded. There was really no preparation. I think I read somewhere that like they were like, oh, well, we could turn it off if it starts to shock you. But otherwise, he's just sliding on the phone. These bulbs are exploding. And it was shot from like three or four different angles, all of which they use in the film because it kind of, even though it's showing the same thing multiple times, there was just the sense of this is so incredible. Who cares about the reality of it? Like, let's just show you that this really happened. You know, and so much of, of to me, with great movie stunts, especially now in the age of CGI, which was the case then, so much of what makes a great movie stunt is the sense of danger and knowing that it could happen. And, and it doesn't mean that somebody's life needs to be uh, in danger, but you need to feel it as an audience member. You need to know that. Um, it's why people love the Mission Impossible films, where Tom Cruise, you know, you're like, oh, you can't fake him being on that build. You can't fake him being in that plane. But it all comes down to that incredible um, police story stunt, which I have to say, that, that's probably my favorite movie stunt, and uh, I wouldn't have, uh, probably wouldn't have gotten around to it if it weren't Tom. So thank you for that, sir. Well, I do what I can. All right, so mine is going to be... Uh, there's, there's plenty I could pick from, and I, I thought about a lot. Uh, that ending of Police Story definitely was something in mind, but there's one bit in the general that got me thinking of a specific stunt, and it's because it's so not, like, obviously dangerous, where you just think, oh, it's obviously, like, rigged in some way where if they... If he missed this stunt, it wouldn't be that disastrous. It's the scene where he's hanging off the front of the train and he's trying to clear the debris from the Union soldiers are like throwing shit on the tracks to try to derail him. And there's just one bit where he takes a like a big piece of wood, like a two by four, uses it, throws it at another two by four and knocks it off right before it hits, thus derailing it. And you think, oh, it's probably set up where it wouldn't derail. No, if they if he missed it. It would have derailed and he would have died. So it reminded me of this bit in an entry from a franchise Mike just referenced, uh, Mission Impossible 2. There's a bit where at, in the end fight where Tom Cruise is fighting Dugray Scott, you know, everyone's favorite actor, where there's a, he pulls a knife and tries to stab Tom Cruise in the eye with it. And there's a close up of the knife and Tom Cruise's eye. And your mind immediately goes, oh, obviously this is fake. No one's going to let a knife be that close to movie star Tom Cruise's eyeball. Um, no, that they did. Tom Cruise insisted on them using a real knife and getting it that close to his face. Yeah, they had to lie to the insurance company to, and say, yeah, it's going to be fake all this time. He's not going to do any of this so they could get bonded. It's just one. It's just uh, there's plenty of other crazy shit Tom does in those movies where you go, oh, yeah, that's obviously the, the craziest stunt. Um, but just that, just something about that just, just sticks in my mind of just there there's no reason for this it's so minor in the grand scheme of things and yet the actor was still gonna let themselves maybe die if it goes wrong so uh tom cruise almost getting knifed in the face in mission impossible 2 is uh something i felt needed to be brought up 
All aboard! We're talking 1927's The General here on You're Missing Out with special guest John Koshell. Our guest today described himself as a media professional and recovering educator, but to us, he will always be Professor John Koshell, who was uh, Tom and I's professor freshman year and on through film school. This is so exciting for us. John, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure then. It is now. Well, I mean, that's not entirely true. Tom and I uh, got up to some some uh, wild antics back in the day with uh, crazy filmmaking stories. Yeah, I can assure you the uh, pleasure was all ours, and I guarantee <laughs> you it wasn't yours. <laughs> you taught uh, so many different subjects, but you uh, would always do these classes that were called uh, major figures or forces in cinema. And I think most people would assume, okay, if you're supposed to teach a class about a major figure in cinema, uh, you're going to do uh, the standards. You're going to do Kubrick. You're going to do uh, Hitchcock or whoever. And if you're doing a force, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, science fiction or noir or what have you. And while you would do those, sometimes you also were the person to, to vary it up and do things that nobody else would think of doing. Uh, while we were there, you did a class on zombie films. You did a class on remakes. I happened to be in that remake class. It was great. Um, and we did uh, Sidney Lumet and and Milos Forman and a lot of things that people wouldn't necessarily think of. And it really, uh, it was it was a great time. Well, I I had fun, and it was always fun. First of all, just showing movies that I liked, and knowing that, and I think it's apropos of the concept of your show. I I thought. Gee, the way people's collective memory forgets makes it easier and easier to pull out something that's an absolute gem that people aren't aware of and could be reminded of. And so it was always really fun for me to be mining for these things that I thought uh, no one knew how great they were, and then all of a sudden to share that. And the idea of listening to people talk about what they liked about a film was uh, a, a real pleasure for me. And so that's why it's really fun to be here with you guys now, because that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's it was, um, you know, and, and also, you know, we're, we're so glad, Evan, you were you were so uh, fundamental to us kind of learning about film and in the history of film. Uh, and like I said, whether it was zombies or remakes, there was always this sense of like, the, you know, it, it's easy to assume that like film school kids. I mean, I know when I went to film school, uh, I was uh, wildly pretentious uh, my freshman year. Uh <laughs> I was, you don't say. Yeah. Uh, I think I remember espousing at one point, like early on freshman year, like, I swear to God, I, I, I believe I said this like two weeks into film school where I went, I don't know if anybody should be making comedies when there's real world suffering. And <laughs> then like I ended up seeing Sullivan's Travels and going, oh, I'm that guy. I'm the worst. Right. <laughs> you never talked down to a movie. You know, there was never this sense especially at a time where uh, superhero movies were taking off and all these things were happening, you know, uh, it would have been very easy for somebody to go, uh, zombie movies, who cares? That's dumb. Or, oh, remakes are always trash. And instead, you know, uh, you kind of imparted on us, I think the biggest thing you imparted on us in terms of watching movies was there's no monolithic rule for what makes a good movie or a bad movie. And, and you, you know, if you look hard enough you can find value in things and you can find something interesting, even in the kind of movies that people might otherwise write off. And certainly how they are products of their time. And yeah. Why something that may be popular or not popular today was then. And then through that, you could understand about that time. I think one of the great benefits of having taught film classes were one that I got my education, just choosing what I wanted to study for myself. And uh, secondly, that the, uh, it, it was a real, it was one of the best ways I was able to learn about the history of the world, the history of the United States by seeing how this or that particular film was, uh, was uh, resonating themes of that particular time. So it became an interesting way to learn, uh, learn history. And uh, I just got to say, you know, Jumping on what Mike said, um, just go into film school and, and all that. Like, there's plenty of professors that, and, and and you even see it today with any sort of film fandom or just anybody that likes film. People tend to really take this stuff very seriously. And, you know, p 
people t- tend to forget that you know this shit is fun. It's movies. Like you're supp- you, you can break them down and talk about them and make them like a serious part of your life. But at the end of the day, you need you sh- you should be enjoying these things. It shouldn't be like um, a war. Like if somebody doesn't like what you like or if they like what you don't like, it should just be like l- like watch everything because all cinema is is you know relevant. It's useful. It's worthy. We didn't get that all the time in college from either professors or other students where it just felt like an intellectual like uh, measuring stick. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was great having you to make, um, you know, to, to, to make those four years um, uh, expansive, but also entertaining. Well, you're too kind, but I did keep that in my back pocket. I was always thinking that if I really had... Uh reason to get even with a class i could sh- just show last year at marion bad <laughs> <laughs> well we definitely did have to watch that in a class not not one of yours so uh that that wasn't one of the best but uh you know but yeah and I, we also i want to promise our listeners that we we do have a film to discuss we did not turn this episode just into mr holland's opus um as i as, as i did not expect uh this would become and we just has become an outpouring of emotions now that you're here it, it is so great we we still have so many memories of uh of those classes be it the the films that we watched the discussions we had or even and i swear to you this is true i was uh last i think two years ago i should say not last year two years ago i attended the engagement party of one of our classmates uh who's also a past guest to this show carrie ferrante uh yeah. and we were all sitting around a table a bunch of us and we were recalling things from school, and we remembered just things that I'm sure you have forgotten you did. Um, you did a Hitchcock class, and one at uh, one day when you were saying the names of the films, you accidentally said "Life Goat" instead of "Life Boat," <laughs> and rather than correct yourself, chose to then roll through every other Hitchcock title, <laughs> inserting the word "goat," <laughs> so it became "Psych Goat," "Vertigoat." North by North Goat, the goats. And I I don't think you understand. That has stuck with all of us for a decade. Uh, sorry. <laughs> that, that is that will live in our minds forever. And it's uh, it's a thing that I'm sure you don't even remember having said. <laughs> no, I forgot about life goat. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It's but it's great. And I, I, I will concede. Um it, Carrie is partly to thank for why you're here because when I uh, I was talking to her about, you know, oh, we're reaching uh, the end of the season and I really want to get somebody good on for the general. I really want to get somebody on who can speak to this in an informed way and can, you know, because uh, a lot of our listeners who have reached out to us are, you know, some of them are, are younger people who are learning about film partly through this show. And sometimes it's hard to make the, the case for, for, oh, you should watch this silent film. You should check it out. It's worth doing. And she was the one who suggested you should reach out to Koshel. And I remember just being like, oh, he's not going to want to do this silly little thing. Like, he won't even remember who the hell we are and this and that. And, and then, you know, I, I reached out and, and you were uh, so eager to do it. And I, we, we were honestly just thrilled you remembered who we were. Uh, that, <laughs> was, that was exciting enough. <laughs> it always comes back to me. It just sometimes takes a day. Yeah, that's fair. That's who was who? <laughs> I remember once borrowing your guitar in class. That is, oh, what a what an A plus moment. I had, yeah, I had brought my guitar with me because I used to bring it to campus. Um, uh, because I was that guy from Animal House that gets his guitar smashed. And you turned around and said, "Hey, can I? You mind if I just like uh, play around with that for a sec?" And you know, most times when you bring guitars and somebody says that, you hand it to them, and they, I don't know, know the chords to Hey Jude, and that's about it. So I handed it to you, and you had not said anything about your your musical abilities prior to this, and you just went into a blues solo. <laughs> it was wild. It ruled. Uh, yeah, lucky day. It was lucky. <laughs> you know, I want about film and music. My film teacher, uh, I, I just learned uh, the, the guy who really inspired me when I was in college, and it was like what an island in a sea of other uh, experiences that it was great to find him and uh, he was the drummer for the holy modal rounders who uh, he just passed away and he was at several schools that, that i attended and um but he was a film professor for a long time but also this drummer and the, uh, he was he replaced sam shepherd in the holy modal rounders and, and the holy modal rounders at the end of easy rider 
Uh, that's the group that plays If You Want to Be a Bird. If You Want to Be a Bird when yeah, uh, they're yeah. on the motorcycles. And so uh, I think music and film uh, really go well together. And in fact, in my interest to become a film teacher, because I thought, well, partly it would make my parents impressed because they would hear the teacher part uh, you know, and forget about the dentist part that they were interested in or whatever it was that they wanted me to do. But um, uh, I, I was, uh, I've discovered that uh, a lot of schools wanted you to have experience in the world of film. And so in seeking that, I ended up working with a, an incredible editor, uh, who edited uh, Flashdance and uh, 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 The Exorcist and uh, I was an apprentice. I started as an apprentice in his room, and I would just say, "Tell me what you think editing is." And I, I you know, and he would uh, he'd say, "Why do you want this?" I said, "Well, because I, I really want to teach, and so I'm trying to get my life experience here from this." And I know that you're a, a fantastic editor. You know, he, at the time I'd read in uh, one of the trades how he was one of the people in America who was at that time pioneering the use of jump cut editing after uh, it had been, you know. Uh, innovated in uh, French New Wave films and films of that sort. And uh, I remember saying, you know, so tell me, what is editing to you? And he said to me, um, it's about rhythm. And he, I, I then observed that any time he worked on a film, he would start to look at the motions in the film and start to move his body, just very subtly and gently moving in his, to discover what he perceived as the rhythm that he could overlay the, the visual motions and how that would inform where the cut points were and how he was gonna structure the cuts based upon either the upbeats or the downbeats. And, and subsequently I learned that uh, Sidney Lumet and uh, Ralph Rosenblum, who was a great editor, uh, had uh, certain recordings in their edit rooms or, or when they were either as the director or as the editor of a film working on the films that they listened to to sort of evoke rhythms that they were uh, imparting upon the scenes that they were cutting. And it's very true in the films of uh, Griffith that I discovered when I started prepping to, I didn't intend initially to teach film history classes. I was started teaching editing classes, but I had to fill in and then it became the thing that I did the most. Uh, that, uh, that editing and rhythm and music really are like all integral to one another. And that's certainly true of the uh, filmmaker and star that we're here to talk about today, which is which is Buster Keaton. Uh, you know, despite uh, being a silent film, you know, when you talk about the rhythm of the editing, there is something musical to it. Yes. So before we talk about the general, let's talk about why the National Film Registry said the general should be inducted. So here's what the National Film Registry had to say. In what may be his most memorable film, Buster Keaton plays a Southern Railway engineer who has only two loves in his life, his locomotive, the general, and the beautiful Annabelle Lee, Marion Mack. One of the most expensive films of its time, including an accurate historical recreation of a true-life Civil War episode in which a train is stolen by the enemy, hundreds of extras, dangerous stunt sequences, which Keaton performed himself, and an actual locomotive falling from a burning bridge into a gorge far below. A commercial failure at the time of release, audiences felt it lacked the humor of Keaton's other films, The General is now considered a classic of comedic understatement by film historians and audiences. So that's what the National Film Registry had to say. So uh, let, me, let me start by asking, uh, John, when I reached out to you and you, I, I said, would you want to do this? You know, would you want to do The General? Uh, you mentioned that you had a picture of Buster Keaton by uh, your workstation that you, you were looking at as you wrote uh, the response. What, what does Buster Keaton mean to you? Well, I love comedy, and he makes me laugh more than uh, you know, nine out of ten, or I think that's unfair to him. More than you know, most comedians, he makes me laugh. Uh, he uh, is an amazing, uh, an amazing filmmaker. Uh, in his understanding of um, the uh, you know, editing and uh, rhythm, as we discussed. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, I, I have certain criteria that I sort of um, use to evaluate filmmakers uh, to, you know, that my, the point system, it's not really a point system, but the way I consider what is meritorious in a filmmaker's work. And among them are uh, the uh, use of uh, 
editing versus not editing and the mise-en-scene, what's going on in the foreground, background, what's going on within the still frame, what's the content of the image versus the context of the image among other images. And um, Keaton can really dazzle you with both. He can have a setup where within the scene, things are going on in the foreground and the background. And we could talk more specifically about specific scenes at some point you know, later on in the discussion, but he could also, uh, he could also, the, the, the rhythmic editing and the balance of the angles. I, I remember re-looking at uh, the general in preparation for this discussion. I was uh, amazed at the, the, the just relentless pacing and, and his character is a relentless character. What's also wonderful about his character is how he uh, is a human being in a, wor a real world governed by physical forces of things that like gravity and things like uh, simple machines, whether it's the lever. Uh, you know, the Archimedes said, give me a, a long enough lever and I could move the world. Uh, the seesaw you know, type of lever uh, and the kinds of acrobatics that you could do with a seesaw, but things like uh, viscosity uh, or uh, friction, um, the wheel, the screw, there are these uh, just basic, simple things that uh, we use in our lives as tools and forces that we experience. Wind, how many times he's leaning into the wind, uh, his physicality is extraordinary his uh, the, the the what he could do with his body how he can lean forward against a wind and not fall forward or backward uh, where he could practically you know touch his hands to the floor behind him and he can do back over flips so he's an extraordinary physical person and much is made of him you know his his uh, one of his nicknames was the great stone face and uh, i think that to really be accurate about his face. His mouth may not have moved, but his eyes are unbelievably expressive. And, you know, when I first set out to learn what it was that I wanted to try to address in a, a class, uh, one of the basic questions I asked myself was, what is drama? And I, I, I came up with, uh, I, I didn't make it up, I, I came upon definitions such as drama is conflict. And you know, I just thought it was overly simplifying things. But the more I thought about it, I thought, no, that's profound that, you know, it's uh, one, uh, one thing against another thing. And how, who wins? And is it victorious or is it tragically ending? Uh, is it sad? Is it a happy victory? So um, there's, a, there's a drama in his face the, that his mouth it would be stoic and resolute as he faces the wind, as he confronts the forces of gravity, as he uh, deals with something of an extraordinary weight or something with no weight. And so where, as his mouth is not reacting or responding, not expressing happiness or sadness, his eyes are. And his eyes express, uh, they're, they're beautiful eyes, and they express every emotion from longing to romance to uh, anger to fierceness uh, to, again, determination. So I, I like this character of this man in the real world that I could relate to that hasn't changed from the years that Keaton was making films to now. And also, he's represents and he's really a product of his time and it's a time that i really and one of the reasons why i have the picture that you're referring to is uh it's a picture of him with rewinds uh, uh in a projection booth where i spent a lot of my life whether i was in college running a film society or, or teaching classes where i got to retreat to the uh projection booth and back in the day you'd always have rewinds because uh you you were showing film and you wanted to be able to, you didn't want to rewind it on the projector because it could tear the sprockets. or So you wanted to take it off and put it on the rewind. And it was also quicker. And so he's in this room with these rewinds. And uh, my wife, uh, when she was my girlfriend in college, knew that I was really uh, you know, trying to uh, become independent from uh, you know, the, the desires of my, my parents and bought me a set of rewinds for like our first uh, Valentine's Day. 
later on, she bought me a piece of mozzarella cheese, t- which was shaped like a heart. And I thought, like, this is cl- too close to reality for me. Uh, but uh, the, so he's with the rewinds. Now, the, the thing further about the rewinds, not just that I share a, a, a love of the rewinds, but he uh, he likes he, he's the mechanical age of uh, of uh, or the late industrial age was an age where um, bicycles, which are gears and chains and wheels and sprockets and film which is sprockets and sprocket holes and gears. And there's a legendary story how he was uh, working at first for Fatty Arbuckle and uh, it started as a gag writer for him. But that night he took home the camera and took the camera apart and put it back together. Uh, and uh, it, 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 this appreciation for the, the way the gears work. Now, the locomotive, the train, which is actually the general, which was a surprise to me because I, I knew that this had to do with the Civil War. I assumed the general was referring to a military rank, but it actually refers to the name of a locomotive. And y- y- you know the look of a locomotive train with the big wheels and the, the, that are moving on a gear. I, I'm not sure what the shaft is that rotates the wheels, but these, these, uh, these mechanical devices that uh, we are familiar with were really the state of the art at, at the turn of the century when he was making his films. And so he's a, a reflection of uh, these simple tools and machines that were so important to revolutionizing society. The same way, um, there's, there's one of his short films. He receives a, a house, a kit house, a house that was, they used, Sears used to make houses. They're in the uh, uh, they're national historically recognized uh, landmark homes now because you used to be able to go to your uh, uh, Sears catalog and order a house, a Cape Cod, and they would deliver it by train to the nearest depot and you could build it up. And so he he's, uh, has one of his episodes where he puts together a house, but someone switched the box numbers and he, the house is all wrong. And so he's reflecting the same way we talk about Amazon.com today, the way it's affecting how we shop and how we work and what our workplace is uh, from this time that I think we probably all have as some kind of a touchstone because, I mean, I don't know if kids are immediately handed a cell phone or maybe there's a point before that where you're dealing with a tricycle, but he he touches back to a time that, at least for me, uh, that seems to be uh, universal in terms of the kinds of tools that people are, are using in uh, in the world. The short you evoke, by the way, is is one week, which if our listeners haven't seen, is also worth checking out, and also uh, features an elaborate train gag. Speaking of train gags, if you the the Kino re-release of the General has a second disc that has a compilation of of train gags of Keaton's train gags, and that is. A mind blower in and of itself. It's um, and it's funny you mentioned his work with with Fatty Arbuckle because I realized on this viewing that what I find so interesting about Keaton is is in part, I mean his the way that he uses his physicality is so distinct that it's it's copied for decades after. I mean there's there's no way uh, that you can watch a Buster Keaton film and not think oh this is where Jacques Tati got it from and this is where so many others get it from. But one thing I thought was interesting is, you know, Charlie Chaplin, uh, and I'm a big Chaplin fan. We we covered Modern Times earlier on the show. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was a very distinct uh, physicality, and and whether he was playing the little tramp or not, you knew what Charlie Chaplin looked like. What I think is so interesting is that when you watch Keaton in those early um, uh, Fatty Arbuckle shorts, because he first appears with Fatty in in Butcher Boy. Um, but he's in a number of shorts with Fatty. Uh, my favorite is Coney Island, where he plays very against type. Uh, you know, you you never think of Buster Keaton being like the the enviable one, but in this one, he's the guy that's got the gal, and and Fatty's jealous, which is funny to see. But when you see him with Fatty, you think of Buster as as very lanky, and therefore your mind thinks of him as very tall too, because you know, compared to Fatty, he's he's, he's uh, lanky. But then you watch something like The General, and they're making so much about what a little guy he is. And you kind of realize part of what is remarkable about Buster Keaton to me is that for whatever it is about his makeup, maybe it's just from his vaudeville days and all that, but whatever it is about him and his his body and his look, 
you could buy him as anything. You know, if the movie's trying to tell us he's a tall, lanky guy, you can buy that. If they're trying to tell us he's a short, little guy, you can buy that. He kind of can just be whatever the premise needs him to be, and you buy it, you know? When you're that in t- attuned to your physicality, um, you, you, it's easier for you to sell uh, pretty much anything. It's why, you know, modern days, you could, you know, Tom Cruise is a wee little fella, but there was a big hullabaloo when he was cast as Jack Reacher because Jack Reacher was described as like a Dwayne Johnson type and Tom Cruise is one of Dwayne Johnson's legs. But Tom Cruise is maybe not to the to the, uh, extent of Buster Keaton, but is so attuned to his physicality that he played that role so well. You don't look at him in scenes where he's beating up rooms full of guys believably and say, oh, this is got this guy's like five foot three. You go, oh, yeah, this is a big, tough guy that you don't want to be in a room with. Um, you know, similar with Jackie Chan, probably the absolute direct descendant of Buster Keaton. You see the way he moves and you just believe he could do he could be anybody because he's so good at these movements obviously it doesn't matter if he's six foot eight or five foot two he's he's jackie chan he's buster keaton they can do this thing and uh you know the filmmaking around it is what helps sell it because we see we do actually see them do do these things you know we 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 don't have cuts hiding buster keaton uh you know having stunt doubles or having to do it uh a hundred times or we do the build up and then we get to the punchline as a different angle so he could do it. Uh it's all just these you know, we see him. The filmmaking is selling this and you know, Buster Keaton he could sell all that shit pretty pretty easily, I think. Well you know in um in a- animation there's a technique called um squash and stretch. And uh, I think it was an article by James Agee uh, about silent comedy and where it went. And he, I believe, whether it was he or not, but the the premise of this argument was that the uh, the silent comedy became uh, became the cartoon, uh, the Warner Brothers uh, uh, cartoon later on, in that um, the kinds of uh, violent um, uh, stunts that you saw acted out in Keaton films, where you're amazed that he didn't get killed, although he supposedly broke every bone in his body when he was. And I saw some interview with him, with, with someone who knew him, saying you could talk to him and he would roll up a pant leg and say, "I got that scar from this film," or "See, I got this uh, bruise from that film." And uh, his body was a, a roadmap of all the different films he made. So he was always putting himself into these uh, extremely physical situations. He's a real physical comedian, and when that, and and having begun his career in a vaudeville act with uh, Houdini and his mother and father, he uh, was trained from youth to be able to do these things. And so uh, there's not many contemporaries uh, of his or people who followed who really had begun at such a young age in training to do physical uh, stage work the way he did. And so uh, his ability to stretch himself or to squash himself is like an animated figure. He's more like, um, you know, a a daffy duck in the way his body could move than most other actual human beings. It's funny you mentioned the cartoons, too, because I was watching. um, If anybody uh, is interested in Buster Keaton, who's listening to this and wants to know a little more about him, um, Peter Bogdanovich, I think two, three years ago, uh, did a documentary about him called The Great Buster. Um, which is probably uh, my favorite uh, thing Peter Bogdanovich has ever done. And listeners of this show know that is a low bar, but still, uh, it's it's, uh, Peter Bogdanovich. Um, And he interviews everybody from, he talks to Quentin Tarantino uh, and and Dick Van Dyke, but he also talks to uh, Johnny Knoxville from Jackass. And most interestingly, uh, John Watts, the director of the uh, new Marvel Spider-Man movies, who says that uh, Buster Keaton... Uh, and the the way that he his face was so animated was important to him because he said, "Well, I'm directing a character who can only emote through their eyes uh, mm-hmm. with the mask and all." And so he talked about how important Buster Keaton was to that. In this film, um, it's stated that Chuck Jones uh, talked about how important Buster Keaton was to so many of the characters he worked on. And a thing I noticed, you know, you watch Buster Keaton films and you think about its influence on the Looney Tunes. Uh, that's very easy to see. You know, you look at that and go, well, of course, this comes, this becomes Wiley e. Coyote, this becomes this, this becomes that. One thing I found interesting 
is that uh, one gag in the general ends up reused in a Disney cartoon. Now, normally you don't think of Disney cartoons, particularly post black and white era for being slapstick. But um, there is a bit in in the general. uh, So he's uh, he goes to Annabelle's house and he's followed by these kids. They go to the house. He's trying to talk to her. And the kids are sitting on the couch. So what does he do? He picks up his hat, puts it on to make it look like he's about to leave, you know, and he's doing a little move and, and leads the kids out the door and then slams the door behind them and takes the hat off and jumps back down to, to make time with his gal. And that exact bit is replicated in a Donald Duck short, I believe called Mr. Duck Goes Out, which is uh, Donald doing that to Huey, Dewey and Louie. And again, like you don't, you wouldn't think, oh, this has an influence. But I mean, obviously, Steamboat Bill Jr. becomes Steamboat Willie, but you wouldn't think it. But even the little gags, not even the over the top things, not even the house falling, but even the little gags in this film live on for decades after. People are still taking them and still riffing on them and still building on them, which I think is so interesting. Well, uh, the general, he had a, in the general, he had a co director uh, by the name of Clyde Brookman. And I wasn't, immediately familiar with Clyde Brookman's work. But um, what I learned is that uh, he directed the Abbott and Costello television show, many of those, and was a gag writer for uh, for them and for the Three Stooges and for lots of these old black and white uh, short pieces and television shows, uh, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, and he, he also directed the, the great W.C. Fields' um, Fatal Glass of Beer, which mm. uh, has the classic line, um, uh, Fields would go to a door, open the door. Uh, it was set in the Klondike. He would open the door and uh, a handful of confetti snow would be tossed into his face, very fake looking. And he would say over and over and again, it's not a fit night out for man or beast. And so that was uh, directed by, um, by Brookman, the co-director of this film, who was the person who su- suggested to Keaton that uh, the novel from which the, the the movie The General was based would be an interesting uh, piece subject matter for a, a film for Keaton, and so um, yes, yeah, sorry, no, no, you were saying, please continue. Over to you. No, back to you. No, I, when you mentioned the novel, it's so interesting because this is a true story. This this happened, uh, I I believe, as far as I can tell, <laughs> historical fact. This story has been told since, and what I think is so interesting is that to to evoke Disney again. Um, you know, I, there is a Disney film of this exact same story, except the story itself, there is no Confederate hero, the one that Keaton's playing. The actual story is about Union soldiers, Union spies, stealing this train and destroying the tracks and blowing up the bridges and all that. And it's it's a victorious story of Union espionage. And if you watch the Disney version, uh, which is called The Great Locomotive Chase, which comes out in the 60s, uh, which stars, by the way, uh, Fess Parker, who uh, I and John and uh, no one listening to this under the age of 40 will remember as Davy Crockett uh, or the dad that says shoot old yeller. Uh, and Fess Parker is in it playing the, the lead union spy. Uh, it was also allegedly uh, remade in the 40s with Red Skelton. I don't know if anybody came across this, but if you read up on the film, or even if you watch Peter Bogdanovich's film, The Great Buster, they mention that the general was remade as a Red Skelton film called A Southern Yankee. Well, uh, well uh, Keaton actually advised to Lucille Ball and to Red Skelton later on and, and the Marx Brothers. And also, um, Brookman uh, was uh, known to have repurposed a lot of the gags that they devised in, in the, the early one and two reeler era of working with Keaton and, and he would um, re uh, reuse them, uh, dust them off and use them again for Abbott and Costello or for the three stooges. So as you said before that you'd seen some of these same gags repeated in other ways, uh, that that's part of the reason that uh, uh, these people use the same gags. It's interesting. You mentioned Lucy too, uh, to go even further down this rabbit hole. So Keaton actually advised on this Red Skelton film, Southern Yankee, which was directed by Edward Sedgwick, who would go on to direct the uh, mostly uh, underwhelming uh, MGM entries by Keaton, which is after Keaton uh, kind of gives up his creative freedom uh, to MGM. 
So Sedgwick had directed The Cameraman and uh, What No Beer and a number of those. Uh, Sedgwick, as you mentioned, Lucy, Sedgwick's last directing credit is a 1953 film called I Love Lucy the Movie, which uh, was a feature film adaptation of I Love Lucy starring Lucille Paul and Desi Arnaz that apparently, from what I read, had one test screening in Bakersfield, California, and then they buried it never to be seen, which is just a fascinating little thing. The thing about Southern Yankee uh, that I found so bizarre, the the writing, so many pieces posit that this is a remake, uh, and then the, the Bogdanovich documentary says this is a remake, so I decided, well, and Buster Keaton advised on it, I'm so curious, so I watched it this morning, a Southern Yankee. Um, and I gotta tell you, uh, I have no idea how this qualifies as a remake of The General in any way. It follows Red Skelton as a union spy, so not the character Buster Keaton's playing, and it's just him going undercover in the South, uh, and also, there's no train. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, I think you're splitting hairs here, Mike. Um, so, so it's a remake insofar as it is in the Civil War. Which is crazy because honestly, like looking into the real story and how it did happen, this would be a great, great movie that would, you know, ostensibly share some similarities with the Buster Keaton movie. But I mean, it's really, you just tell it from these, what, eight or 10 Union soldiers who sneak yeah. down and start destroying shit and then they get captured and like the four leaders get, uh, the eight, lead, eight leaders get hung. Uh, they yeah. had to make an entirely new um, what what you call it? Where, um, God damn it, I can't remember where they they had to build a longer version <laughs> of the gallows, uh, the, yeah, the yeah. galleys, the gallows, so they could hang all eight of them in public, and then the rest, like ten, I guess, guys, was left over that was used to trade for Confederate uh, prisoners of war. The guys who got hung were posthumously awarded with the Medal of Honor. Well, the er the original version of the Medal of Honor. The rest yeah. of the guys were given that too. I mean, which this is, is a true, great. Which is true yeah. that they did. Yeah, it's, this is like. Right. Yeah, this would be like a great like. I want Spielberg to make this goddamn movie because uh, this sounds Tom, like. Can I correct? You? Can I correct huh? you on one thing? The leader of the uh, the leader of the expedition could not be rewarded the Medal of Honor because he was a civilian. That's the even more amazing of this. So the character oh, that okay. if you watch even better. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, that's what that is. What the Great Locomotive Chase is, uh, and I have a copy of it. I'll loan it to you if you want. It's it's um, and that's the Fess Parker character is the the civilian that leads it. Um, so it has been done as a drama. What I think is interesting about this film, to me, uh, and what makes the case for Keaton as a storyteller and as an artist, is that Tom, you are absolutely right that that the the actual story makes for it is so cinematic and so made to be a film and what buster keaton does is he takes a kernel of that story spins it in an entirely different direction and yet manages to pull it off brilliantly and he does it, well, you know it is a it's it's yeah. wild how not the story it is but like also it's really close to like yeah they, i even saw that they the the when the train got captured like the two confederate i think or the guys running the train station i can't remember the exact but like two it was two guys they did jump on a hand cart trying to chase after them then you know the the levels of like how they got finally caught up to them was not too different to how it progresses in this movie i mean it's it's a wild balancing act of adapting a story making it almost nothing like the real story but also weirdly accurate which is uh you know I mean, good, good on you, Buster. I mean, I, 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 like I said before, I want Spielberg in his uh, old man teaching the youngins about history phase of his <laughs> career to make a store uh, a movie about this because it would be like, I, like I don't know, runaway runaway train mixed with Lincoln. <laughs> I mean, like, and oh, sorry, John, go ahead. Yeah, a few points that I want to make on this. So, um, uh, Keaton did. I read that he spoke out in an interview late in his life against the Disney version. And I searched and searched for the quote, but it was only available by audio if I were in England. I don't understand how the, it's not available in your area, but I would have loved to have learned exactly what it was that he particularly didn't like about the Disney version. But it, it, it had to do with the shifting of the perspective from 
the uh, the Northerners being heroes, which if they were given Congressional Medal of Honors, with the exception of the uh, the leader of the group who had uh, not been in the uh, services and the armed forces, uh, that he uh, he sp- he didn't like the film. Uh, he didn't like the uh, the way the perspective and thought it was a mistake. So I'd like to hear exactly what his analysis of that was. But well, it, it, one of the things that's always sort of like um, I had trouble with with respect to Griffith and you know uh, and uh, Keaton. The first, when I first saw this film, when I was I loved as I said I loved his shorts. And, you know, the film was not a success when it came out, I think, as you said, uh, did, I'm not sure if you mentioned it in the introduction, but it was not uh, received well by uh, critics initially. And I think people were looking for nonstop Keaton gags and the kind of concentration that you got in his short films. But this is a masterful, uh, super spectacle epic along the lines and much emulating um, Birth of a Nation. So it, it emulates Birth of a Nation. We can get into tremendous detail, but at the very least, uh, in in the attempt to uh, try to make a film that was based on realism. And so uh, Keaton instructed his crew and his cinematographer that they wanted to recreate the famous Civil War photographs that uh, Matthew Brady and his associates took on the battlefields of the Civil War. And, uh, and and they rebuilt, they went to Oregon to shoot the film. They uh, went there because it had a particular gauge of railroad track that was true to the, the trains of the period. They rebuilt the town. They rebuilt flat car trains to uh, replicate period trains of the Civil War. And while they, like Griffith, one of the great advances that uh, he he brought forth in Birth of a Nation from the films prior to his was that there was this tremendous attention to detail on the walls. So instead of having a painting of a, a clock on the wall, you'd actually have a real clock, which seems, you know, so it wasn't a painted backdrop like you'd see in a, a cheap theater production. It was real the real use of props. And, uh, you know, people interacting with props and touching the props. And, of course, Keaton is an amazing uh, prop artist. And, and what he could do with a broom or a tea kettle is uh, hilarious and very and, and endlessly inventive. But how both of them could aspire for uh, realism in props and backgrounds and uh, but overlook, you know, certain realities like to have uh, characters in Birth of a Nation – uh, playing uh, you know horribly exaggerated racial stereotypes and think that otherwise they're sticklers for great detail but there are not even african american people playing the roles of african american people in those films and in terms of keaton's film how he could be a stickler for detail in terms of the gauge of a railroad track however the story is of a heroic southerner and i have to say that uh, among the I, I couldn't even conceive of, as a person growing up in the North and from New York City, I couldn't even conceive of, a, I thought, wait, what am I not understanding about this? How could there be a, a Confederate hero? And so uh, Keaton s- suggested, and this is, uh, there's a really interesting uh, article by uh, a scholar from uh, Indiana University that um, uh, s- talks about the um, the myth of the um, uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, around the time of uh, the uh, birth of a nation, the the Civil War, the the um, Ku Klux Klan had been largely dissolved after the Civil War, but the 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 persuasive film techniques, the rhythmic editing, the cross cutting back and forth, and the accelerations of the montage had people getting very excited. Uh, that you know, one side was going to beat the other side, but uh, unfortunately, it was the Ku Klux Klan that was coming to the rescue in *Birth of a Nation*. And uh, you know, and to me, unfortunately, the the heroism of the Northern spies is not acknowledged in the film, but the uh, uh, the, the heroism of the the Confederate engineer is. So. Um, there was an attempt to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the the lost Southern um, 
soldiers who were dying off around 1910, 1920, uh, in the 1920s. And the, the, that's when, and it's been much discussed recently, that uh, these monuments of, of the Stars and Bars and of the uh, of Confederate generals, that they, uh, that they were actually put up around this time in the 1920s. And the, the largest Ku Klux Klan rally ever held in Washington, D.C. occurred the year before uh, the general. The general, I think, came out in 26. Uh, it, it, it didn't get to uh, into the theaters until 27 uh, because uh, the, the film that had been in the theater prior to that was held over because it was successful. And so, um, but it, the, the, just the sense of the time was, uh, you know, President Wilson was showing Birth of a Nation in the uh, in the White House and claiming that it was history written with a lightning bolt. And I think that he's quoted even in the intertitle cards there. And Griffith was a huge uh, fan of, as it was everybody in Hollywood. Everybody in Hollywood loved D.W. Griffith because uh, he came up with the idea that Hollywood's built on, that of the blockbuster, you know, that now is like, you know, Tom Cruise owns that, right? So he came up with this idea that if you could make a little bit of money uh, from uh, a little bit of an investment in a short film. Imagine if you put a lot of money into a film and you can make a lot of money. And so uh, he, uh, I, I believe that that's sort of what happened to um, to uh, Keaton, that he made this film thinking that it would be a, a blockbuster. It's famously, it famously has the most uh, expensive shot of the, ever shot in the silent era when the, when they burn down and collapse a bridge and um but i i think it, it, do you, do you guys think it might be possible that the the film was less popular than it might have been in its time if he had not had a a, a southern uh a southern hero and uh, according to one thing i did read that keaton said is he felt that uh that northerners would sort of be indifferent to a southern hero especially at this time in history where they had some distance from the Civil War and they were dealing with the problems of the North and less concerned with problems of the South, whereas the South, a, su a Southern audience, they felt that they would, would be alienated by having a, uh, a, a Northern hero. And so perhaps the decision to change the history of the story was based upon you know that kind of economics. I... Ha forgotten a lot of details since the last time you know since i saw this first probably i think back in college so i was very surprised to realize that this was ostensibly a pro-confederate movie especially <laughs> after a few of the movies we got through this year it's like all right we got to be very careful about gone with the wind we got to be very careful about intolerance we got to you know we got to deal with this stuff it's very the searchers you know there's these problematic things and i was like okay i got a buster keaton movie now that should be easy and fun and goes <laughs> oh shit it's pro-confederate and like not even like accidentally pro-confederate this is very like to the point this guy is a hero. It's sad that he can't be let into the army because of uh you know because he he's a, he's a conductor and it's very heroic that he stops the, the the union spies and it's great that he gets the girl because she's so happy that he can fight for the the confederacy and they win the battle at the end and everything's great because long live the confederacy quite surprising uh in, in my viewing to dovetail into uh, the question uh john just asked i'm not sure if that has anything to do with the success or not of the movie. I mean, you know, like kind of like Keaton said, would the North really give a shit at this point? Because birth of a nation was only what nine years ago at the, at that point, And people kind of went rowdy for that movie. Uh, the South would have loved it just unabashedly pro Confederate. Um, so I don't, I don't know, Mike, uh, did you see any research so, indicating why this movie didn't succeed or anything like that? So I don't, I don't have any indications to why it didn't succeed. I'll say this to that point, which is two things. One, one quote I heard from Keaton that I, 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 I guess made a little more sense to me was his suggestion that, um, you know, his films uh, always had an underdog to root for, and that you couldn't make an underdog of the North because they won the war. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment, but I understand yeah. the mentality that led him there. The other thing I will say, and I say this not as a historian, but just as somebody who read a lot of old-timey things, another thing that I sort of feel was in the air around this time, uh, aside from 
uh, you know, horrific racism and historic revisionism is there is a sense there's with enough distance to the civil war that people in the North are starting to learn about what happened to the South in the civil war. Like, you know, we always talk about history is written by the victors, right? And that's true. But then with enough time, you sort of sit back and, and start to realize, okay, well, how exactly do we become the victors? And much in the same way that by the time you get to the sixties, a lot of young Americans are uh, looking at uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and going, "Oh my, oh my God, we why would we do that? That's horrific!" Like I get we won the war, but holy shit, you do start to see around this time, at least from the reading, a lot more discussion about things like Sherman's march to the sea and this scorched earth campaign by Tecumseh Sherman and others to the you know to the south. And especially the fact that during Reconstruction, we brought this part of the country back in. And this is what's documented in the second half of uh, Gone with the Wind. There does start to become this idea of starting to reconcile with. uh, And it's a dangerous thought because it can lead to you sympathizing with terrible people. Uh, But there is this attitude of suddenly like people starting to go, oh, Oh, we did that? Like, oh, we well, burned whole towns and I, I cities found, down? I found, my, I found the quote that I was, I found the quote I was looking for that addresses this. It's by mm-hmm. Laura Evans of Indiana University. And it's a recent post, actually, from February of 2021. And um, it, it's called uh, How the General Fits into the Myth of the Lost Cause. And you could look up the myth of the lost cause, uh, you know, wiki it and everything. And it, it, it's... Um, uh, the, the Civil War was almost, some, while some might say that the Civil War is almost immaterial to the general story, that uh, it's a comic portrayal um, and different from uh, Griffith espousing Confederate ideology, um, the, the Laura Ivins, or Ivins says that the myth of the lost cause erode, er, arose as an effort to reframe the war in order to reunite the nation and quell bitterness and assuage the ego of defeated Southerners by downplaying the conflict over slaveholders' rights and embracing honorable valor, valor of soldiers on both sides. That's the myth. Um, and, and she references this march uh, 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 and the uh, this march on Washington of between 25,000 and 50,000 Ku Klux Klansmen. And it's an extraordinary picture that you could find online in their full uh, regalia. Um, and that uh, for no- she says that for Northern audiences, watching a Confederate hero was unremarkable. For Southern audiences, this was laudable. Uh, so it makes me think that, you know, perhaps uh, this was less of an ideological decision for uh, sh- for the producer, Joe Skank, and for Keaton, and more of a, a, just a, a marketing decision that there would just be, uh, that they thought that they could turn off fewer people this way. But um, uh, perhaps they were wrong because the film did lose money and did end up, uh, you know, pretty much uh, derailing uh, Keaton's career. And meanwhile, it's funny you mentioned that, John, because you want to talk about a Civil War movie that made a lot of money. Uh, we, as we discussed in our Gone with the Wind episode, you know, so many movies, like you mentioned, whether it's Birth of a Nation or The General, try and play up that myth of the lost cause and downplay slave ownership. And right. then you go to Gone with the Wind, which so many people assume does the same thing. And instead, very explicitly throughout that film, Southern characters are like, this is over slavery, right? Yep, we just want our slaves. And you're like, oh, wow. They're just well, it, that, that can be part of like the, it is. the Lost Cause myth as well, because uh, part of the Lost Cause myth was that the slaves were happy, if not grateful, for their, uh, for their situation, which, uh, you know, is pretty absurd. Uh, and, but it's interesting that Gone with the Wind was inducted into the uh, uh, National Historic Registry the same year as, uh, as uh, the, general. the general. And yeah. also that Sunset Boulevard, same year, and Keaton has a bit part in that film. Yep. Yes, he does. It's uh, funny that um, if Keaton's whole thing is about, you know, the underdogs and the North won, so they can't be the underdogs. I uh, wonder, would have been funny if anyone ever just went up to him and was like, yeah, you got you like underdogs. You do know that the uh, entire South was run on free underdog labor. Right. Yeah, you know, I tried to find, whereas you could find uh, a, a lot of uh, political affiliation, especially with movie stars who were around during World War II. 
and who who they were campaigning for or what you know during the new deal and uh, i i could find absolutely nothing about uh, chaplin was you know known for his uh political oh why did, did did chaplin ever talk about his politics i'm sure that it, went it, fine for him I'm sure it but I great. couldn't find anything. There was nothing written explicitly about or by or from Keaton that I could find about himself uh, uh, expressing political. I looked up to see, did he campaign for FDR or not? Or, But um, so anyway, that's all. I couldn't find anything that uh, where he was uh, stating what his where he stood on political issues. Well, which and maybe you know what? Is I think that's that's maybe maybe for the best. The more you dig into some people. Uh, you know, sometimes you turn up some stuff where you just go, "Oh no." Well, I asked I, myself, uh, "Could I? Would I? Do I have to think about the appropriateness of, uh, you know, what what was F Troop saying about the Civil War?" But then I think, yeah, everything is really, you know, that's an adage from film study that every film is a political statement because it, you know, it casts people in roles and reinforces roles that you know maybe were unchallenged at a time and that you know maybe are viewed differently at a different time by the way speaking of f troop just fun fact larry storch is still alive yes i was ju- for it's funny you mentioned f troop i was looking up larry storch earlier today he is i believe 98 oh. but the guy fun who played fact. the bugler died two days ago who would hold up his bugle and the arrow would get shot into it no way i did not know that just like two or three days ago wow it's a big well, loss fu- also, funny story, just watched The Serious Man, and there is a lot of talk about the sun watching F Troop because the uh, the satellite is, the antenna is not yep. working. Uh-oh. Yeah, so, uh, cause a wheel. Um, I do think there might be something to something uh, John said before about the success, or uh, in this case, the failure uh, critic- uh, commercially of this movie, in that uh, audiences were expecting one thing from Keaton with this movie, uh, and they didn't get it. Not to say that this isn't a movie with some great bits and some great set pieces and all that, but it isn't like rat a tat that and stretching it out to what is ostensibly just one long chase. And it's like some bits, there's just some not, there's just areas where there's no bits. It's like plot and we got to move the story along. And I, I, I just wonder if, um, I don't know. Maybe if Keaton got too big for his britches, I, I like. I want to say like he, he overestimated his uh, 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 idea for this movie and the audience's willingness to accept this new uh, experience. I mean, because uh, I think the name Keaton uh, uh, suggests expectations of uh, you know uh, crammed with gags and. If you're looking to see a Keaton film and expecting gag after gag, there are some, as you say, great gags in the thing, great stunts, but there there are cinematic marvels that are transcendent in the film, which can we shift into a discussion of that for a minute? By all means. the, The moving camera is like just unbelievable. So to watch this film and just see the, the movement is nonstop, and it's such an amazing Rube Goldberg machine, a puzzle. It's like I, 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 every once in a while, I, I don't know what it's called, but you can see uh, on the news they show some kid who bounced a Super Ball down the steps, and then it hits a little a, a, a seesaw that knocks something up into a glass that, and, and all these causes and effects of. Um, the, of uh, dropping something or dominoes hitting one another. So anyway, Rube Goldberg was an animator and an engineer, and he would devise these funny uh, machines that were just absurd, but they would work, because, and they had pulleys and gears and wheels. And so this this film is just uh, nonstop motion, and he hired 500 National Guardsmen from Oregon, and he would dress them at times in the blue uniforms of the North, and at other times the the same actors would switch and wear the gray uniforms and he'd have them moving from left to right as they were advancing to the north or right to left as they were pursuing uh, the, the train back to the south. And the, the screen direction and the cutting back and forth, the, just the motion and the, the motion of uh, he, he chose the area because it had two sets of railroad tracks running in parallel and he was able to put his 
camera train running next to the train on which he was performing the the stunts, which of course is which included things like running on top of the train while the train's moving from left to right, but the people running on top of the train maintain their same place in the frame because it's like being on a treadmill. The treadmill's running, but you're running and the treadmill's moving, but you're not don't appear to be, you know, moving forward or backward, while the background has the war being fought and people in the uniforms moving left and right behind them. And it's, a, it's kaleidoscopic. It's really mesmerizing. And at the same time, you could analyze that because Keaton's in the foreground doing his thing. In this case, he's chopping up one of the railroad cars to use as wood for fuel for the furnace in the engine. And he's just working resolutely at his work while the train is moving one way and the action is moving both ways behind it. So, you know, the the magnificence of the cinematic technique uh, of the editing and the angles and this movement and the complexity of it and the, the accomplishment of Keaton as a film director to have efficiently marshaled 500 actors to look like over a thousand, you know, before there was CGI and you could make it look like there were that many people in the stadium, you know, through effects was, is, is just brilliant. And it really is astounding and it is beautiful. It's not all gags, but there are other things that you, that people had to get over. I want to see a laugh a minute. There are plenty of laughs, but, there's other stuff to appreciate in the film way beyond the laughs. And I, I mean, I was thinking that too, because it's, you know, from practically the get go, I mean, this movie starts, you get one establishing shot of the train and then we're in a tracking shot. We're moving right along with it. And, you know, you do kind of sit back. You were mentioning the, you know, the camera train next to it. It just immediately immerses you in it. And, and you're right. There's so much to marvel at with this. And I, what I wonder with this, uh, is, and this is a problem we have with today's audiences too. we, uh, just talked on an episode last week about, you know, my push for people should watch the movie for what it is, not what they want it to be. Uh, you know, I, and this is not to dismiss the other film I'm about to evoke, but this is the same year in 1927. This is the same year as Wings. And people loved uh, the, the visual flair and the, the dazzling action of Wings. And there's that same, uh, if not greater, level of 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 death defying, dazzling action in this. But people went in expecting a straight comedy, and because it wasn't that, uh, they they missed so much marvelous uh, filmmaking and 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 marvelous technique uh, because they were looking for it to be something that it wasn't. Did we mention Harry Houdini? Uh, up top, you mentioned that he had been with Buster Keaton's family during the vaudeville days. There we go. So I, I think that uh, one of the other th- things that inform Keaton's gags was that experience he had seeing and growing up in an act with this consummate illusionist and escape artist, uh, you know, who was able to, uh, you know, dislocate his shoulders to be able to get himself out of a uh, straight jacket and uh, you know, the, to be able to use your body in these ways to do things that seem other uh, impossible to you know, regular folks. So, um, and, and to delight in these, uh, these uh, visual illusions that, uh, you know, are devised and, and are very complex using the mechanics of stagecraft and camera craft and editing craft to uh, create these illusions. And, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's at, at the turn of the century and in the late industrial revolution, there was such a fascination with trains that everybody knows the f- old story of the Lumiere's film of train arriving at a station. And um, I, I, again, a shout out to my old uh, film teacher who asked the, one of the first film classes, like, what did these, di- what directoral decisions had to be made to make the film a uh, train arriving at a station? And it, it, he suggested that it, the camera position that, uh, and I remember uh, from a cinematography teacher that I had talking about the difference that the different perceptions an audience has of a train coming at you. Uh, And the the old story was people jumping out of their seats because they'd never seen a picture that appeared to be moving toward you when they saw the train coming towards you. And versus 
something moving left to right across the stream uh, screen when it appears to happen much faster. Uh, everybody knows the compression shot when you're looking down Fifth Avenue with a telephoto lens and people seem to be moving but never getting closer to you. When, when something's coming at you, it appears somewhat slower, but more, uh, you know, perhaps more threatening as it comes away from the, the, the screen towards you. And when movement happens uh, laterally, it seems to go by more, more quickly. And I wanted to uh, address the idea of the capper. The capper was part of the uh, the structure of a silent gag, and um, it meant that you know you wanted to do something uh, a a that the audience thought had a resolution, but then there was a, a surprise resolution at the end. And so, just the fact that he took this train coming at you, and, and then put himself on the front of the train, himself on the cow catcher, and it's one of the most striking, often replicated stills from the movie is his face on the front of a train coming at the camera uh, is very, very effective and sort of outdoes any shots of trains coming towards you that didn't have Buster Keaton riding on the front of it. Yeah. And it's your, and part of the, the appeal throughout this is that I, I think what's so remarkable with this is, you know, and, and uh, people often talk about the, the, the idea of the action comedy, right? This is a, this is a subgenre that we have now. And too often when people do an action comedy, what they do is they end up taking the, the it, their idea of an action comedy is let's take the bite out of an action film, right? Let's, let's point out how silly action films are. And instead, you know, the best action comedy is what this film is because what it does is it understands and what Keaton understands in this film is that there is the same degree of tension and release in uh a suspense scene and a comedy scene they're in different directions you know with the releases and all that but there's still just this uh, this this feeling of tension and then the you know whether it's the punchline or you know them them uh you know pulling off the stunt there's that that release of it so when you're watching him you mentioned him on the on the cow catcher for example you know there is a there is a perfect blend of the the humor of the image, but also you're connected to this character. You're you're feeling this character, so you are actually feeling the tension of is he going to make it? What's he going to do? How's he going to get out of this one? It and he compounds. He compounds the the peril that he's in. It's never just one level. It's then it's my my father in law was in the Pacific for four years on eight invasions of islands and then he came back and ended up managing the actor studio theater and i remember uh one of his adages was get him up the tree throw rocks at him get him out of the tree it's like how could you create a problem for somebody and then make it worse he's stuck in the tree well now he's stuck in the tree and somebody's throwing rocks at him and now how do you get him out of the tree and so with keaton's gags they just keep piling on and piling on and and with the the thing that's so great about a lot of the silent comedies is that I think one of the examples, I think the first time I read about a capper was uh, somebody who uh, goes off the edge of a cliff and you think they're dead, but then they grab onto a vine or a tree root and you realize, oh, great, they're not dead. They're hanging on by a branch, but then a bird comes and sits on their head and that's the straw that broke the camel's back or the bird that broke the twig and down they go it's a capper it's uh, you thought you uh, you had a level of tension they upped it another notch and so uh in the film uh, was one week where he puts together the house mm -hmm. uh he it ends up getting stuck on the railroad track a train again comes by speeding by from left to right uh, but you're surprised by the illusion that the house is in the foreground, but the train has come by in the background, and you, you can't tell from the position of the camera that the train is not going to actually hit the house. And it's so on a different he, track, yeah. Right. He and the, uh, right, it's not because it's on a different track. And so he hugs his love at the moment in relief, and instantly a train comes from the other direction and destroys the house. So uh, the, the capper. And uh, I think the, there's uh, one of the notable scenes uh, from the uh, general has to do with that bizarre cannon, which, according to an interview I heard with Keaton, uh, they actually discovered it was actually what cannons really looked like. It looks like a prop from 
you know, a, a silent film, yeah. but it's actually how absurd cam- cannons looked back then. And, um, how the uh, you you think that uh, he he's going to um, uh, fire off the cannon, but uh, to resolve the the scene, but then the cannon s- suddenly tilts down, and now the cannon is going to fire actually at him f- and shoot into the engine where he is. So uh, he it's it's amazing how he piles on one aspect of uh, of uh, conflict on top of the other and how also uh, the, another thing i thought was striking sort of uh, taking a little turn over here was how elemental the, the the conflicts are they they he engages with um fire right there's they they at the end of the film they set fire to a bridge they set fire to trees they they blow up trees so there's the, the bridge is over water the bridge itself is one of those simple tools that I mentioned. Cantilevers, you know, uh, is another simple tool uh, that he he that seemed to defy the laws of nature because there's some other equal and opposite law of nature that he he demonstrates the human attempt to uh, control and work with and live with. And so um, he he engages very elemental things of fire, water, standing into the wind. And uh, all of those things like are just piled on top of one another to make his gags like it just I find them compelling to keep watching. I, I think the most impressive thing with Keaton too, and and you see it, you know, best uh, you know exemplified in this film, but even something like Sherlock Jr. and others, you would think it would be easy to think that somebody who came from vaudeville would, as a result, make very sort of stagey films. Uh, you know, there are so many of those people that did. I mean, even going into the sound era, uh, how many uh, people, I mean, look, I, I mean, no disrespect, but I have watched far too many Jimmy Durante films that are just Jimmy Durante doing his vaudeville act. You would assume that somebody like Keaton coming from that background would make things that were very, uh, you know, stagey or make things that were very artificial. And instead, you're mentioning not just the elemental elements, but the way that he's, he's using the, the trees and the bridge. There's something about how he really just seems to look at all of the possibilities that the medium of film offers and to try and figure out how is he going to do this? How is he going to do this particular trick or this particular stunt? I mean, even if it's the way he makes the boat sink in, in Steamboat Bill Jr. or or jumping into the film in, in, in uh, Sherlock Jr. Uh, and, and with this too, I mean, it, it's the fact that one almost has to wonder if the appeal to him uh, as you suggested with the the love of the mechanical uh if the appeal here was really just uh less a civil war story and more what could i do in a civil war setting and how many things could i do with the train we haven't even talked about one of my favorite little bits which is the um oh my god i i don't know the term either the, the thing between the wheels on a train the little bar <laughs> neither was not, i should have looked that up i was trying to prep you know <laughs> that's but we all had there's there's a lot. This is a you know, with the, but the the way that he rises up and down on that, there's just you could clearly tell that once he heard about a train, he was like his mind was racing with the the many different bits and gags you could do with uh, every part of the train. It's kind of like you know the expression of using every part of the buffalo. Like he really does just make use of every single element of a train, every single thing you could do with this uh, this setting and prop. Well, you know, I think a lot of that must have to come from the connection to Houdini because all illusion is about, you know, the angle you portray it, like what you see, what you don't, you know, it's the, you know, the prestige and all that, you know, it, it's all build up, set up what you can see, what you can't see, what we're letting you see, how we're presenting it, all that stuff. And transmitting that, transplanting that into cinema i mean it's like the perfect balance for him of the vaudeville thing of you know set up and gags and using the the areas around you and props and all that and the uh the visual idea of illusions i mean it seems like it came together so well for him and he sort of figured it must have figured at some point like oh a camera can be used to hide the seams or we could let we could use the camera to make people see what I want them to see. So the, the illusion works even better. And then we could build an illusion so we can make things even bigger than I could do on a stage. You know, um, it seems like uh, every step of the way was kind of the, uh, the perfect uh, backstory for him to do what he was able to do. 
so similar to the illusions of uh, you know Houdini, where uh, the, the 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 premise, I guess, very often is that someone is going to do something um, death defying. You know, we're going to saw a woman in half, or I'm going to be hanging upside down in a straitjacket. And let's see if I could get it out, and let's see if I, uh, when I'm underwater, if I can escape my bond, my chains, and uh, uh, free myself before I need to breathe. And um, so, so since a lot of what Houdini uh, did in his show was allowing an audience to see a a figure on stage who seems to be uh, have his, having his life threatened or his safety or his health or his well-being threatened, and that uh, Keaton demonstrates that over and over again through these stunts that seem like they might kill somebody. So in one interview, uh, he was asked about his not smiling. And he uh, early, in a couple interviews, in one interview I heard him talk about how as a kid once his father was throwing him around the room. and uh, he loved it. He enjoyed this and he smiled and he found that the audiences did not laugh at him as much when he was laughing and enjoying himself. And he was asked by uh, a, a critic in some interview again, late in his life, whether he thought that comedy had as its basis sadness, which I, I hate to think, but you know, I, I maybe I, I can't question Buster Keaton. And he said, Absolutely. He said because he felt that the audience liked looking at him in danger and thinking, I'm so glad that's not me, that there was a feeling of relief that you experience when, you know, you're made to be tense, made to feel tense and uneasy by uh, the, the person on stage who seems to be in danger and, and, and in compounded danger. And, and you're, you're, you're able to feel better about yourself because you're not so that that was i'm paraphrasing keaton no i think that's true and i think that that's what we were saying about the the idea of the way that he expands on that in this and keeps the you know brings in the tension of an action film you know a thriller a suspense film while incorporating the comedy and he never sacrifices one for the other that's that's the thing that's so remarkable about this to watch now, I think, is that it never loses any of the dramatic tension of a train chase. It never loses the dramatic tension of the actual story in and amongst its gags. And I think part of that is because because his character is the underdog in this film and the humor is at his expense for the most part. If the dramatic tension we're feeling, if the suspense we're feeling is how much danger this guy is in and how 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 much of an underdog he is, every gag where things get worse for him, while funny, also adds to this feeling of, oh, God, how could it get worse? Which this is a funny segue, which leads me to something else uh, about his life uh, getting worse is that uh, a recurrent theme in all of his films is trouble with his in-laws and it's in this film also um in um in that he's he he would like to join the uh the army but he's not allowed to do so because it's thought that his position as a uh, train conductor is uh more important and um but as a result of not being allowed to join the army his in-laws reject him. And um, this appears over and over and over again in Keaton films. And there's some backstory to this. The person who, uh, who produced the film, Joe Skenk, uh, it's, it's not spelled like that, but I believe that's how it's pronounced, uh, was um, one of the presidents of United Artists at one time. And uh, he actually owned Palisades Amusement Park in New Jersey. And, you know, the whole film business began really in New Jersey with Edison and D.W. Griffith went actually sold, uh, tried to sell a script to um, Edison at the Edison Studios in New Jersey. And instead he get, got instead he got cast as um, uh, the, 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 the person who uh, instead he got cast in um, Rescued from an Eagle's Nest by Edwin S. Porter, produced by uh, Edison Studios. And so um, they all moved out. To California because of better weather and better backdrops, and because they were uh, other filmmakers wanted to not have to uh, deal with the 
paying um, for patents and royalties for, for things that were in, on the East Coast. And California was pretty remote uh, back at that time. But Joe uh, Skank was his father-in-law and, uh, again, had owned uh, Palisades Amusement Park and was uh, later on a president of, um, of uh, United Artists and was married to uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the great silent stars of the time, um, uh, what's uh, the Talmadge, uh, Norma Talmadge, who was a big money maker. And uh, it, it was suggested there's a great documentary on uh, Keaton by Kevin Brownlow called um, uh, uh, A Hard Act to Follow. And they interview people who were married to Keaton or who worked with Keaton. And uh, one of the interviewees uh, talked about how uh, it was probable that uh, Skank in wanted uh, Keaton to marry uh, one of the Talmadge sisters who was not actually a successful actress and that they were all pretty much living off of him. And so there, there's always, or very often in Keaton's films, are his uh, having abusive, uh, leeching, uh, disapproving in-laws that uh, have to motivate his uh, his suffering. And so that adds to the uh, the conflict that he has to deal with. There's this domestic conflict. And so it's in, it's in the general as well. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, among the things that I like to uh, check off to see what a filmmaker could do is how well do they deal with uh, mise-en-scene and uh, telling a story from under the proscenium, uh, how masterful are they with their uh, rhythmic editing and their camera placement and their use of uh, shots and, and how they uh, interconnect. And also, uh, to what extent does a filmmaker over the course of his work uh, somehow reflect himself or his or her perceptions of society and the world around him? And so in the case of Keaton, uh, the, this sort of domestic conflict with, your, uh, with disapproving family members is something that's often a motivation in his films. And it's interesting you bring that up because one of the things that struck me with this is that the, the motivating factor for him, uh, the motivating factor for Keaton's character in this film is the, the way that his love interest, Annabelle Lee, says, uh, uh, says, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to see you again until you're in uniform, right? And this idea of treating him like he's a coward, especially because uh, the other men come forward and say, oh, he wasn't even in line despite him trying to enlist several times. And I was thinking about how tales of refuting cowardice like this or uh, the Four Feathers, which comes along later, they were so in vogue at that time. And I don't feel like that's really a, a, a storyline that we really do anymore is the idea of sort of, uh, you know, of refuting cowardice and this, this motivation of, well, you're not a real man if you're not willing to go to war. And, and that shows up also in, uh, in Gone with the Wind, uh, in, in uh, one of the more confounding moments in the film, as we discussed, when Rhett just suddenly decides, I don't know, I guess I'll go fight for the South now. Uh, it's a weird kind of thing, but I think that in in this case, again, we're talking about the underdog element. The conflicts with in-laws, the conflicts in his romantic relationships just make you want to root for him a little more. You know, it makes you want to, uh, you know, you, you want to see him uh, win the girl, even if she's setting a weird standard for him. You want to see him, uh, you know, get one over on the those that doubt him, which is why, if I can sidebar, it is so bizarre that he's the guy who has the girl in in the the Fatty Arbuckle uh, film, Coney Island, and some of the others, where you know it's one thing you're not used to seeing is Buster Keaton win because he 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 never starts out his films as the winner, you know. Well, I think you're right. I think uh, you do want to root for him for those reasons, and not so much because you're thinking, "Oh my God, I'm glad I'm not him." Yeah. I think you 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 admire his perseverance and his uh, you know against these forces that he of nature and society that he exaggerates to make them even worse than we could ever experience them but he still presses on and and we want to see him win for those reasons and that's why he's uh, you know enjoyable this film was inducted into the uh, national registry i guess the same year as citizen kane and so and like dw griffith's intolerance uh, a, a film where someone thought, if I had a success doing 
whatever, uh, War of the Worlds on the radio, imagine the success I could have making Citizen Kane as a film, or if I had success with uh, what it, my investment might have been in Birth of a Nation, imagine if I make the story of intolerance, uh, retelling the story of Christ, ancient Babylon, a modern story. And the, the idea uh, and, and, and that if you made a little bit of money, you could make a lot of money and uh, that uh, on a bigger investment. And that uh, I, I think that that was part of the it's like in Jeopardy when uh, they say, let's make this a true daily double. Alex, I'm all <laughs> in. You either win big or you lose big. And so uh, uh, he, he, uh, the, this is, uh, the perils of, uh, really investing, uh, a, a lot of, uh, er everything into a blockbuster, but the film is a blockbuster and, uh, blockbusters are advertised uh, in the way this film was advertised, uh, filmed on location, um, actual stunts being performed, daredevil stunts, a cast of thousands, pyrotechnics beyond belief, and, and how spectacle, spectacular elements appeal to the visual senses. So, so the explosions, the fires, the wind, the water, the trains are, uh, are, are uh, sensor, sensory uh, experiences that are out of the ordinary. And when you see something out of the ordinary, um, you know, it, it, it well, anyway, that that's pretty much it. It was a blockbuster, and in this case, it was a blockbuster that didn't return the initial investment. Now, before we talk Oscars, I do want to note that this is uh, the first Buster Keaton film inducted into the registry, but it's not the only one. Uh, of his films uh, in the registry, uh, they have inducted One Week from 1920, Cops from 1922, Sherlock Jr. from 1924, the General from 1926, and both Steamboat Bill Jr. and The Cameraman from 1928. Uh, as of yet, they have not uh, inducted Buster Keaton in How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, but uh, I'm sure that's any day now. Um, yeah, that's the thing I forgot, is that he's in those old uh, AIP beach movies. Oh. I don't know well, if anyone else... Uh, What's funny thing happened to... Uh, he's in A uh, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Yep. Yep, He's... where uh, just just seeing his face appear, um, uh, the stillness of his face in the midst of the madcap going on around him, it's a uh, it's a laugh. See, now i i was watching um, uh, I was watching a scene of him in, in How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, and I've mentioned this on the show before, but um, my significant other uh, was born in in post Soviet Russia. She she moved here when she was like nine or ten, so she doesn't have a real frame of reference for American pop culture. And there's a scene in How to Stuff a Wild Bikini where uh, Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon go to see a witch doctor played by Buster Keaton, who says, I can help you get out of here. Uh, uh, I'll just bring in my daughter. And then uh, this, you see from behind this blonde uh, walk in and he goes, this is my daughter. Uh, she's the real witch. And then she like uh, points her finger and the two of them disappear and they cut. And it's the actress who played Samantha on Bewitched playing Keaton's oh, daughter. And I bring this up because I just watched that scene of Annette Funicello, Frankie Avalon, Buster Keaton, and Samantha from Bewitched and thought, if I played this for her, it would probably take me days to explain what in the hell happened here. <laughs> and like, if you, it's like if you showed a Gen Z kid this, you'd be like, there's so many layers we have to unpack here. And so the actress Elizabeth Montgomery, uh, I think. She yes, is. yes. Elizabeth Montgomery. That's the no. It was, I, I believe it was her. It was not Nicole Kidman from the movie Bewitched. Uh, last a I checked. Weird um, piece of film trivia. Her father, Robert Montgomery, was a great actor. And uh, he's in a film noir that was uh, shot completely in first person subjective camera. You only see him, I think, for one shot in a mirror. And everything else is done through his eyes. Really? Do you remember the name of that film? Uh, I, I could find it in a minute, but uh, the, not at this second. You, you say that because it makes me think of this. Is, uh, now we're getting totally off on a tangent. We will talk about the Oscars. Because uh, you know who did that was um, uh, uh, Robert Zemeckis uh, tried to do that for Tales from the Crypt for an episode. Uh, where he decided that he was going to do an episode that was, and from first person point of view, like you described, um and uh, elizabeth rossellini uh, isabella rossellini is in it uh and the main character uh is supposedly played by humphrey bogart 
And anytime you see the first person perspective, look into a mirror, it's a creepy CGI Humphrey Bogart face, a la the tech from Forrest Gump. It's the lady in the lake. The lady in the lake. Okay. Not to be confused with the lady in the water, the, uh, the M. Night Shyamalan film. So Oscar wise. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. So the, there's a Humphrey Bogart, Humphrey Bogart. This is, yeah. Film where... So Robert Zemeckis did three episodes. He might've done, but he did three episodes for tales of the crypt that they put on a DVD. The first two, I believe he did before Forrest Gump. One of which is an extraordinary, uh, short film with, uh, Kirk Douglas and his son, uh, not Michael, the other son whose name escapes me right now, but it's a very good, uh, story of cowardice and wartime. But then this third one, yeah, that was made post Forrest Gump that begins with the Crypt Keeper dressed as Forrest Gump and then becomes a noir thriller told from a first person point of view that credits Humphrey Bogart. But it's somebody doing a Humphrey Bogart voice impression. And then every once in a while, it cuts to Bogart looking at his reflection and uses a creepy ass CGI Humphrey Bogart face circa like 1996. It's uh, it's questionable. <laughs> it's very questionable. Um, You're telling me Robert Zemeckis did something questionable in his career? <laughs> yeah, it's it's haunting. So we always wrap up talking about the Oscars. Now, one thing I wanted to point out, the general did not receive any Oscar nominations. However, it theoretically could have been nominated for the Academy Awards first year because that covered both the years of 1927 and 1928. Uh, that year, the nominees for Outstanding Picture, what we now call Best Picture, those nominees are films we've discussed before on this show, uh, which are fil- the films The Racket, Seventh Heaven, and the winner for Best Picture, which I evoked earlier in this episode, Wings. Uh, should be noted that while Keaton was not nominated for Best Picture this year, uh, the man often cited as his his chief rival comedically, Charlie Chaplin, was originally nominated for Best Picture for his feature, The Circus, but the Academy revoked that nomination, as well as his nominations for Best Actor and Best Director, uh, choosing instead to give Chaplin a Special Achievement Oscar because they feared if Chaplin remained competitive in those categories, he would sweep the very first Academy Awards. Uh, Unfair. Unfair. Right? Crazy. Uh, very few times have they revoked the nomination, and I'm always fascinated why they did it. There's, I don't remember what it is, but there's one film that if you look it up, it's like, oh, they took its nomination away. Why? We don't know. All right. But yes, so Buster Keaton was not nominated, uh, but he was subsequently honored. He has had a, had a fascinating career. I, I joke about the AIP Beach movies, but uh, there was a remarkable revival of appreciation in, uh, of Buster Keaton's work. John, I want to thank you so much for joining us, uh, even if uh, I, I'm pretty sure Tom and I both felt very awkward saying John, because we kept wanting to say professor throughout this conversation. No, that's, it's John is better. <laughs> but uh, really, I'm so glad you came on. Uh, my, my favorite part of this, sincerely, uh, is that I knew uh, when we spoke on the phone prior to this that I, I could have, you know, after years of teaching as you did, uh, Tom and I probably could have just sat back and been like, do you want to just do that? Just take the show. Just have it. Just do it. Uh, take it away. Uh, I'm I'm so glad you did. This is this is one of my favorite episodes we've done, honestly, and we're uh, d- done with the season, so I can say that with authority. I I I know our listeners are really going to enjoy it, and I'm very glad that uh, for this one episode, uh, they got to uh, sit in on a class with us, uh, and it was <laughs> very nice uh, to get to learn from you again. Uh, thank you so Bye. much for joining us. I, thank, thank you, you so much. much for asking me. Thank you both. It was a thrill. I gotta be honest, I had no real exposure to Buster Keaton films um, in general. I think uh, the most I got was the obviously the scene in this movie uh, where he's uh, pushing all the railway ties off of the tracks. And I remember finally getting to see this movie a couple of days ago. And when I finally got to that scene and see it in its entirety, I immediately kind of connected it, funny enough, to the first time that I played Uncharted 2. And the train scene, obviously. Playing that level felt like this was a reflection of where this art medium was moving and that we had gotten it to the direction where we could replicate emotion and like story bits that you could see in a blockbuster. And I watching watching this scene play out, you know, nearly a hundred years ago, you know, like 
you know, just a little over 90 years ago now. And kind of having that same reaction of just excitement and fun um, kind of spill out of me, I kind of had to, like, my initial wonder was, like, did people feel the same way? And I was surprised to feel or to see that um, its initial release was a relatively poor reaction. And, Mike, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this. And I guess it's just sort of fascinating, again, just to sort of, you know, see this as an example of how the conversation of these films sort of change over the course of time and just uh, really just how interesting the registry is in terms of how they select these things because something that we again uh, at the time of recording we just finished our oscars special and while none of us here at this time believe that we'll be having a conversation about any of those films 10 15 years from now um who knows uh you know who who, who knows what uh, could could go down the road, but um, my question you and you, know, you and Tom don't to clarify you and Tom don't think that I I have expressed that I I think at least one of them will enter the canon. To wrap up like we usually do, what films would you guys include in the registry? A reminder to our listeners: it must be an American film that's at least ten years old. So for me, obviously, there's a lot you could do with Keaton. Um, like we mentioned before in the season with Chaplin, there's a lot you can do. A lot of action stuff. Uh, obviously, we can't bring Jackie in because most of his best stuff was in Hong Kong and uh, really not bringing Rush Hour or the Shanghai Nights movies into this. Um, <laughs> uh, John Wick, uh, th- that trilogy is not 10 years old yet, so you can't make the case for that yet, even with the obvious uh, Buster Keaton references. Um, so I kind of, I don't know, I kind of wanted to go in a different direction instead of going so obviously indebted to Keaton. And um, I just kind of latched on to this um, how self-indulgent in a way this his him making this movie was how he ran the budget up and how he needed to actually destroy that fucking train on the bridge and all that crazy shit um and kind of on accident recently i guess within the last month or two uh i watched a movie that wasn't too dissimilar in the self-indulgent uh we need to shoot all of this train shit real and we got to destroy trains for real and it's going to make this movie take forever to make and it's going to be a nightmare but we have to do it because it's real god damn it and cinema is real god damn it and um it doesn't hurt that i think it's a great movie it's one of the best of the 60s uh it's one of my favorite now from one of my favorite uh stars of old hollywood era uh it's uh also one of my favorites of uh one of the best uh genre directors of all time uh i i saw this movie the train and um the stunt work the you know the effects work the insane just compl- derailing trains just just adds such a flavor to this movie and uh you know it is a it's it's also just a great movie about um it's at world war ii and it's about the nazis are um storing up all the art they have in Paris, putting it on a train and trying to get it to uh, Berlin. And um, uh, everyone's favorite French actor, Burt Lancaster, plays a French resistance fighter who is kind of uh, begrudgingly tasked with stopping this train from getting to Berlin. And it's just a lot of interesting stuff about, you know, heroism, what's like, the you know, about like art and how art, even if it seems not important, it's kind of important to a national identity. And what's what are we willing to risk for, um, you know, a cause and, and all that stuff. And uh, John Frankenheimer directed it, and it's the guy was on a hell of a run back then. This is an amazingly filmed movie. It's thrilling. It's kind of sad. It's uh, just kind of expertly made. And I don't know if there's anything since. That does some crazy train shit real like this movie does. Um, but I can almost guarantee nothing since the general has been as kind of deranged with train stuff uh, as this movie. And um, I think in terms of uh, filmmaking and uh, really um, going to, you know, the bone bleeding for your for your craft the same way Keaton did here. I think uh, I think the train uh, is definitely. Uh, a movie I think should be in the registry, and um, unlike <laughs> unlike the the general, its main characters are not the bad guys in the war. So you know, there's al- also that. Um, I just want to point out, Tom. I think that's the the from what I know about the train, which is not much, but I I think it's it's horrendous 
that they cast an American as a French resistance fighter when they got uh, everyone's favorite German actor, Paul Schofield. <laughs> right? Paul yeah. Schofield is in this, yes? Yeah, he's yeah. the main Nazi. Yeah, yeah, a uh, man for all seasons. Um, Paul Schofield. Uh, I also want to point out, you said, Tom, I don't know if any other films been that crazy with train stuff. Need I remind you, Gore Verbinski destroyed so many trains in 2012. Yeah, but Just that's CGI. So many. No, those were real trains. Well, he built there was real a lot of trains, CGI going on. Built real trains on real tracks and blew up that budget. Anyway, my pick is in a different direction. I was thinking about the general and what category the general occupies. You could call it just a plain comedy, but that doesn't sum it up. You could call it an action comedy, but even that doesn't feel totally right. I, the only way to describe it is an epic comedy. It, it is a comedy film, and comedy so often relies on intimacy. That was Chaplin's whole thing, is he just had potatoes dance, you know, and he could make you laugh. But this is an epic comedy. Epic in scope. Grand in scale. Wild stunts. So the question was, is there anything else like that? Is there any other film that is that is an epic comedy. And I thought of one. And it is a film that actually also stars Buster Keaton. Uh, some other people in this film that are notable figures include Spencer Tracy, Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, Buddy Hackett, Ethel Merman, Mickey Rooney, Dick Sean, Bill Silvers, Terry Thomas, Jonathan Winters, Edie Adams, Eddie Rochester Anderson, Jim Backus, Ben Blue, Joey Brown, Alan Carney, Chick Chandler, Barry Chase, Lloyd Corrigan, Andy Devine, the three Stooges are in this. Roy Roberts is in this. Don Knotts is in this. That's right. Carl Reiner is in this. It's a mad, 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 mad world. For anybody who's not familiar with It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. If you remember the movie Rat Race from the 90s, uh, Rat Race is a bad remake of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. It's a Mad, 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 Mad World is uh, a movie that defies uh, all conventional wisdom. This movie should be terrible, right? It's, it's overloaded with stars. It is loaded up with actors, most of whom don't necessarily have cultural cachet now. Uh, so you would think the cameos wouldn't land in the same way that like when you watch Around the World in 80 Days, uh, the Best Picture winner, there are cameos where you're like, who the hell is that? Why should I care? Um, or an old Looney Tunes cartoon where they do a joke like that. Uh, and this is loaded with people like that. It is also, even at its slenderest, 161 minutes. And most comedies you feel like shouldn't be over 90 minutes. This thing ranges from 160 to 210 minutes. It is an unwieldy nightmare of a runtime. And in addition to that, most people will tell you the only way to properly see it is in 70 millimeter. This is a 70 millimeter three-hour comedy packed with stars. It should be a nightmare, but instead, it's incredibly funny. It is still so goddamn funny. And it, in part because it brings together everybody, these various stars, these various comedians, all doing their shtick, and it all works. The Three Stooges, like I mentioned, are in it. Buster Keaton is in it, and he doesn't miss a beat despite being uh, well into his autumn years. Jimmy Durante shows up at the beginning. Uh, Carl Reiner. It's like everybody who's anybody is in this thing. It, it's an incredibly funny film. It's a wild epic. It, it, the, the, the stunt work in it is incredible. There are so many amazing set pieces. It's so thrilling and gripping. And the most amazing thing is it's directed by Stanley Kramer, who most people know for like the defiant ones in Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, it's incredible. I have heard, I have, I've read and seen stories about, uh, you know, the fact that I believe it, uh, some screening in L.A. where they did a, a 70 millimeter screening of its Mad Men, Mad Men World, uh, Quentin Tarantino <laughs> attended a screening and would applaud any time a new character showed up on screen. <laughs> and during the intermission, turned to the person next to him and was like, so what do you think? What do you think of this film? He just loves it so much he wants to share it. And it is a thing, especially if you're of a certain age where you know who Dick Sean or Phil Silver is. Um, of course you're going to love it. This is an incredible, this is the Avengers of comedy uh, on screen. I know that the Museum of the Moving Image here in New York uh, played it in 70 millimeter a couple times. I really hope to see it in 70. I bought the Criterion Blu-ray, which I highly recommend people check out. It's, in, it's just bug crazy that this film works. It shouldn't work in any way. Uh, it's an incredible feat of comedy filmmaking. 
an epic comedy on a scale that will never be matched again. Uh, and I think for that and preserving so many different performance styles and so many different icons, it absolutely should be in the national film industry. Bad, bad, bad. Thank you for listening, and thanks to John Koshell for joining us. Next week, we're wrapping up the first induction year with Citizen Kane, where we'll be joined by special guest Matt Singer. You can follow our co-hosts on social media, where you can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.